So in this next module, I'm going to wrap up a few points about writing scientific manuscripts before we jump into talking about the publication process. So first of all, I want to talk a little bit about authorship. Of course, this is a very important topic and also sometimes a little tricky. So my main advice on authorship is to kind of think about the authorship before you write the paper, especially if you're the person writing up the paper. Think about who's going to get authorship. Think about what the order will be. Kind of run that by people and establish that early on in the process so everybody's on the same page, so you don't run into any issues after the paper is written. There's sort of two questions you have to answer with authorship. So first of all, who gets authorship? Who are you going to include as an author on your paper? Again, if you're the primary person writing up the paper, who else are you going to include as authors? So the main uh, criterion here is that any author listed on the paper's title page, any author of the paper, should take public responsibility for its content. And that's a fairly high bar. That means, uh, you know, that if you're going to be an author on a paper, that's a pretty high bar that you have, you have to be willing to take public responsibility for that article's content. And um, that means if the paper is later found out to have a problem with it, to have fraud even, to be retracted for some reason, if you're an author on that paper, you are responsible, you are, reli are liable, that is going to reflect badly on you. So really consider um, whether or not, especially if it's not the paper you're writing, if you're a co-author, whether or not you really want to be an author on the paper. Um, and if you're um, the one writing up the paper and you're figuring out, you know, who should I offer authorship to on the paper, keep in mind that a lot of scientists, a lot of authors don't want to be included on your paper unless they can take public responsibility for its content. So for example, you know, sometimes I'll give a little help to somebody on statistics or editing or something and then they'll come back and say, oh, you know, do you want to be an author on the paper? And I do not want to be an author on that paper because I can't take responsibility for its content. I'm, I haven't um, been interested intricately involved uh, with its content. So, um, so just keep in mind that sometimes I think especially junior people feel this obligation to include every senior per person that they've even talked to about the article. In fact, people don't want to be on your paper unless they really can take public responsibility for its content. So, so they're not going to be offended if you don't offer them authorship. Um, if you really feel there's somebody you need to acknowledge for some little help they gave you on the paper that doesn't really merit authorship, consider, consider acknowledging them in the acknowledgement section. I'll talk about that in a minute. So just, you know, again, it's, it's kind of a high bar and, and sometimes authors just get thrown on there for, for bad reasons and really uh, we want to keep it to the people who really can take public responsibility for its content. And then, of course, there's the issue of what order will the authors appear in. And in general, of course, that the order implies the author's relative contributions. So the first author is usually the person who actually wrote up the draft of the paper, might have been the person who collected all the data, you know, often a graduate student or a junior person. Um, there's one exception to this position thing is that the, the last position, the very last author, is often a senior author. So that's a, a position of stature if you're in the last position. So just realize that the senior person often would go there. So again, the senior author, the head of the lab or research team, often will be the last listed author. So that's good to know. Um, occasionally, you know, you might have two graduate students who both did equal work on a paper and you really want to give them both equal credit. You can consider doing dual first authors. That's done sometimes to help in those situations. Sometimes you have a clear first author and a clear last author. The person who wrote up the paper is the first author, the senior person is the last author, the advisor, or whatever. Uh, but then you've got a number of people who made substantial contributions and are going to be co-authors, but they kind of contributed equally. There's no differentiation uh, between those. So for fairness, you know, how do you order those people that kind of come in between? You consider, could consider alphabetical order or even reverse alphabetical order. Uh, I was involved in a series of um, studies which we had a number of people who were very um, central to, to uh, running the study, a number of principal investigators at different sites in the study. So they were on a series of papers that came out with those studies. So on the first paper we put them in alphabetical order, the second pa paper we put them in reverse alphabetical order for fairness. And sometimes you get these large working groups now with lots and lots of people, multi, uh, in, you know, international collaboration. So those large working groups can be cited as a group because they may have hundreds of authors. 
Just be aware that uh, if you're an author on a paper, usually you have to fill out a conflict of interest form. It's usually a specific form. They're a little bit different for each journal, but all the authors have to fill that out. If you're the person submitting the paper, keep in mind that you're going to have to get all the authors to fill those forms out, so leave some time for that. It's very important that they identify any uh, relevant conflicts of interest. All authors also usually have to sign some kind of copyright transfer form for the journal. So again, you need to leave time if you've got multiple authors on a paper to make sure you can get all those signatures. Uh, and some journals actually have forms that require the authors to specify exactly what their involvement was in the manuscript. These are really helpful because then it's really clear to people whether or not they uh, you know, should be an author on the paper. So they have to check off did they in participate in the study planning, the data collection, data analysis. So it's really good uh, for the journals to feel comfortable and sometimes the journals actually even publish this in the manuscript so that you know exactly who did what in the paper. Uh, as I mentioned, there's uh, all um, journal uh, papers have an acknowledgement section. That's where you're going to cite any funding sources. So if you're a graduate student who was on a certain fellowship, make sure you cite your, uh, your funding source there. If it was an NIH sponsored study or whatever, whoever sponsored the study, if there was a, if it was a grant funded study, you're going to mention the grant there. Um, so you put the funding sources in the acknowledgements. This is also the really good place to acknowledge people who you don't feel merit authorship and who probably don't want to be authors on the paper because, they, again, they can't take that public responsibility for it. But maybe they gave you some materials, they offered some statistical consulting, some advice. Um, it's a way to, to acknowledge those people without having them having to take on the role of author. And then finally, I just want to briefly mention references. I already uh, talked a lot about references in an earlier module and about avoiding references to nowhere and making sure that you get your references right. Uh, my biggest recommendation on references is to use a computerized bibliographic program. These will are just so efficient. They will increase your efficiency greatly. They will prevent you from making errors in the references. So um, it's really worth investing in that kind of program, like a, you know something like EndNote. Um, if you have a computerized bibliographic program, you don't have to worry about things like this. Uh, journals differ in how the um, in how you order those references in the reference section. Some journals want alphabetical order. Some journals want how uh, the order in which those references appear in the text. So. Um, it's, you, you, if you're not using a computerized program, you're going to have to figure that out, and it's a real pain to switch between the two. So let's say you submit to one journal, journal that wants alphabetical order, and then it gets rejected, and you have to submit to another journal where they want order of appearance. Switching those manually, and I've had to do it in the past, switching those manually is a huge headache. It takes hours of time, and human error can get introduced at that point. So again, you're best off using that program that will do that automatically for you. Um, be aware that some journals limit the number of references. Figure this out ahead of time before you start writing the manuscript. I've had the situation where uh, we had something like 45 references and then somebody realized that the journal we were submitting to only allowed 30. It is incredibly hard to go back and take references out because your whole text kind of depends on those references. So you have to make major changes to your text. So find out ahead of time if there's a limit on the number of references. Uh, and follow journal formatting rules. Again, if you're using a computerized program, that program will know all of the specifics how well each journal likes their formatting done. So it'll save you a headache. Uh, otherwise, you've got to go to the instructions for authors or you know, go to a paper that's already published in that journal and just look at how uh, their references are formatted. So here's an example, sort of a typical way that references are formatted. You've got the author's name, it's usually the last name, and then their first and uh, middle initial if they have one with no punctuation. At the end of that list, there's a period. Some journals will have you list all the authors, some will have you list three with an et al. So again, you got to know uh, which it is for a particular journal. Then there's the, uh, the title comes next. Then the journal name in italics, it's usually abbreviated. And again, you got to follow the standards for abbreviation. Um, the computerized program, bibliographic program will know that. Uh, then you usually have the, the year of date, not the um, month, but just the year, a semicolon, and then the volume, a colon, and then the page numbers. And again, different journals will have slight differences in that and how you format those, so make sure you um, figure that out or use a program that already knows how to format for all the journals. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University please visit us at med.stanford.edu.